Yeah. Um, I'm going to read mainly from the kids, uh, which is a book about teaching and learning. Um, I was a teacher uh, for many years in a sick form um, in a city, sick form in London. And that's how the book started, was me like thinking back on my years and thought when I put my glasses on, I'd become a teacher. I was a teacher. <laughs> and um, I thought I would jump in somewhere in the middle, because I've been reading these poems quite a lot in sequence, but it'd be nice to do it another way around. So, when I was teaching English GCSE reset and English A level, um, before the times of like risk assessment and health and safety, which have made taking young people out on trips a bit of a nightmare, um, we used to take 60 or so kids, 60 kids, sometimes 80, and we wanted to take 80 kids to the theatre to go and see Shakespeare. And these were kids, and some of them have been to the theatre lots in their lives, and others of them, it might have been their first time going to the theatre. And I was with one trip when we went to see 12th night and uh, I said to my GCSE students, um, you can get food there in the interval, but it, you know, it's quite expensive, you know, ice cream and all that. I said, you can bring, bring something from home. And then in the interval, when I looked down, they'd all, uh, they were putting out the Tupperware of fried chicken, two litre bottles of uh, Tizer, or Fanta, Doritos, and one of, my, one of my colleagues said, you know, rather bright, um, I used to love taking the kids to the theatre, but it was also sort of hard work. And he said once, this is more like bloody dog walking than teaching. The sixth form theatre trip. You've got more dogs than you can count. Big dogs and small. One badass dog in headphones mooching up the aisle. A dog who smuggled in a hot dog. Two loving dogs, back row, already smooching. Some dogs are up on haunches, barking. A dog or two, already dozing, heads in paws, dogs sighing and dreaming. The other theatre dogs look down their snouts. A pair of tutting chow chows, some slowly poodles in the box. But when the curtains lift and your dogs are hypnotised, their ears like little hoisted sails, the wag of tails, their shining dog hearts fling wide open. They know these words, these lines, memorised like buried bones. Don't you love your dogs? I did love those kids, but sometimes, um, you know, uh, it's funny in, in the book, I had so many good relationships with students and so many good things happened in the classroom. But all, the, all these years after I left teaching, when I was writing these poems, it was the difficult moments, the difficult students, the, the ones I could seem to hate me, <laughs> that I found myself writing about. Um, but the poem I'll read to you next is, um, is about, I didn't have a, an English degree, and so I often was only um, a few steps ahead of the students that I was teaching, especially English A level. I was teaching like literary, literary periods that I didn't, I didn't know anything about whatsoever. So I was learning in the month before, the week before, sometimes the night before. And that's why I didn't know how to pronounce the name of Samuel Pepys, the restoration diarist, although I'm sure you all do know how to do <laughs> know that it's not spelled the same as it sounds. Peppies. The posh girls came and took a corner table, all lip gloss and ribbony hair, and each with a fan of starry GCSEs and a summer of youth hostels in Europe behind them, and the future wide open to them like a rainbow parasol, or so I thought. It was restoration comedies, and I was reading the class an essay, and though I'd seen his name, I'd never heard it. Peppies, I said it, peppies, over and over, until one girl spoke up. Do you mean peeps, she said. Her voice pulled taut as a noose, as if I were the girl and she the teacher. And what could I have said? I read on, peppies, 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 cool as the trickster, ridiculous as the fool. I think what I actually said in that class was some, um, no, that's, that Samuel Pepys is a different restoration diarist from Samuel Pepys. <laughs> and, you know, 
Uh, on we went. <laughs> Sometimes teaching felt like the art of, uh, you know, lag. Um, so, you know, often I was trying, I was, you know, some of the kids absolutely loved reading and some students absolutely, you know, hated reading and um, because we used to, we used to, we were a bit of, we were sort of bleeding heart liberals in the English department and we used to let kids in with like terrible GCSE results onto A level English. Um, so you'd often get a load of kids that had wanted to do maths, physics and chemistry and got the grades and come and do English. So um, when you, you say to them, what do you like reading? Some might say that, we don't, we don't like reading. <laughs> we don't like don't reading at all. The art of teaching too. Boredom hangs like a low cloud in the classroom. Each page we read is a step up a mountain in gluey boots. Even the clock face is pained, and yes, I'm sure now ticking slower. If gloom has a sound, it's the voice of Leroy reading Frankenstein aloud. And if we break to talk, I know my questions are feeble sparks that won't ignite my students' barely beating hearts. There is no volta here, no turn, just more of the same, the cloud sinking ever lower, the air damper, yet more rain, and the task is unchanging, like spending years chasing a monster you yourself created. Leroy asks if you can stop reading. I say, for now, you can. So, um, you may know, uh, I don't know, the book is written predominantly in the sonnet forms. So they all sort of look like that on the page, pretty much, with a few like liberties taken. And um, I didn't mean to write so many sonnets, but um, once I started, I couldn't stop. And uh, I began to see that almost the sonnet, the square shape, in some ways, like mimetically, like a classroom, or a blackboard, or a page in a book, or whatever. And so many of these poems are about classroom encounters. So I think that's why I carried on with the form in part. Um, so, uh, when you're young, like the last thing you want um, your teacher to do is to encroach on your uh, territory as a young person. So like whatever you've got into, like let's say you're into skateboarding or you've got really into dog reggae or whatever it is, the last thing you want is your teacher telling you how much they know about the thing that you're into or, or for that matter anyone older than them because that's what being youthful is, isn't it? It's believing that you have made these discoveries. This is your stuff. All over it. Dwayne's final media project is on graffiti. I'm all over it, he says. So obviously you tell him about Dan, your older brother, years back, spraying one train, then another, with a jangling sack of cans he'd robbed from home base and wire cutters from the shed. You reminisce. The police, the social worker, sat while Danny tanked the bathroom mirror, then tiptoed down the stairs and out the door, mum crying in the kitchen. How much more? She hid his point poop, she hid his puma suede to keep him in. He threw a red brick through our window, running barefoot down the street. You tell Dwayne this, but he's backing out the room. Yeah, nice one, miss. Um, I'll read out a couple of poems from later in the book. I think because we've had, heard such beautiful music, I'll read a couple of uh, poems on musical themes. Um, my mum was a, a really brilliant pianist, um, but she rarely, she rarely played as an adult. I think she was like always just too, too busy. Uh, but in my head, um, she loved the music of uh, Scott Joplin. Rap time, and you know, it was great skill to play that. And there's one particular, a very beautiful waltz called Bethina that my mum um, used to play. That's the title of the poem, Bethina. If I asked, she'd put down her cigarettes or tea towel and sit on the emerald velvet stool, and from her hands, tight knitted hands, the notes fell out like gloves unraveling their wool. 
She plays Scott Joplin's Waltz Bethina, its title like her name. So I thought that song was in her fingers, its pining melody, a silk scarf full of crotchets, quavers. That song was in her fingers, like there are songs in mine, though I rarely play, so little time. But today I'm listening to Scott Joplin on my speaker and thinking of the glee, green and glacial drawing room, the way she played those dying phrases, the grace, the pain. Bethany is my mother's given name. And a poem for my piano teachers who I think if I've got any ability uh, in writing metrically, it is from my very, very strict piano teacher, Miss Forbes, drilling it into me in various different ways when I was four or five, which is when I started to play the piano. Um, Etudio. I played the beautiful music of the dead, horses, etudes. Miss Forbes would hold her 2B pencil and make the faintest marks in lead. So particular, a parlour with its sills of old cracked china and dried camellias. She said, if only you would practice more. And when I did, my hands would sing across the keys. With her, I learned what learning was for. She died. I went to Sharon, who wore black, embroidered skirts, black lipstick, blue-black hair, her thin, mercurial hands. In the room upstairs, I played Debussy, better than before, but my eye was on the albums lent in stacks beside the door, the Smiths, the Clash, the Cure. Um, I'll read um, a poem. So the book is dedicated to my own. So the reason I became a sixth form teacher was because I'd had really brilliant teaching at that age. I had not been allowed into my secondary school because I was behaved at my secondary school sick form so off I went to the local FE college um, and there I had such brilliant teaching from two teachers called John uh, the book's dedicated to John Toulon um, who just taught a very radical English curriculum completely different from what I've been doing uh, up until that point I'm like reading Thomas Hardy and Dickens, value in them, but John Toulon gave us Enter Zaki Shange's for Coloured Girls Who Considered Suicide as our first able text, which is like a, it's a radical book by today's standards, poems set to dance about black women's experiences in America. Um, so he really opened my eyes to the possibilities of literature, um, galvanised my love for it, but I'm going to read you more a kind of sentimental uh, love poem for him. John, Pink Hummingbird. The postcard he sent you that long wet summer had on one side a pale pink hummingbird and overleaf his notes on your essay on Faulkner in his usual turquoise ink. The words you imagined written in sunlight on the bed of his book stuffed flat and each weighed with care like a love letter that was you that wanted him. All summer, you waited for September to be back again in the tattered classroom with the tables pushed together and him at the top, like a doting father or a bridegroom, or like God if God wore Dr. Martin's shoes and a silver sleeper in one ear. Not the God you didn't believe in, but one who believed in you. So the book is about like formal and informal learning. So the things that we learn that are useful and instructive, and perhaps things that are maybe more uh, damaging, but also useful perhaps um, as well. Players. My parents taught me smoking. The midnight nip to the SO garage for 20 players. The kitchen table vigil lighting one tip from another, then another. So matches or lighter, they bend to the cooker's flame. No credit or cash, my dad would search the bin to twist tobacco from dog ends, squeeze it, suck it in. 
or flush they pile nine or ten black boxes on the bureau, small coffins in a stack. Stained walls, grey fog, the constant tweezering of fags that plug between the lips. It took me years to stop, though still some lonely nights I spark one up, and that red light in the darkness leads me back to where they're waiting, holding out the pack. Um, I'll just read a couple more poems to you. Actually, no, I'm going to read a new poem because I can't stop writing sonnets. Since this book, I haven't written a single poem that isn't a sonnet. It's like I need to go and see someone for an exorcism or something. Um, I can't see why any poems should be longer than 14 lines now. Uh, but it also create, creates a lot of problems when you try and do that because... Um, there's only so much you can say. Anyway, um, uh, the poem includes something that the poet Liz Berry said to me. We were both expecting um, that children, but at the same time, uh, we were both pregnant at the same time. Um, machines. Easter Monday, and all I do is washing, stuffing the mouth of the machine, then tugging out, then hanging. How many beautiful dresses are needed for one life, or lacy undies whiter than white? All day I'm crying, my eyes gone sudsy. Pity me tears, a kind of lovely, kind of awful. I cry in cycles, steady rinse, then spin. As soon as I'm dry, I cry again. Liz once said she wished her belly had a glass door like a washing machine so she could check her little sleeping baby, clean her mind of all the fear and fretting. But we've only got our eyes for screens, peering out, sometimes peering in. And I'll read two more poems. I'll read a, a lullaby from my son, uh, Rory, who's now eight, but the poem was probably from when he, he must have been at the school nursery, so four, and it was the, his first um, the World Book Day, I'm sure anyone that's got children of that age will know, will know, nightmare, World Book Day, I haven't got a costume, nothing on Amazon, Amazon can't deliver what we're going to make. And so Roy was very uh, excited about World Book Day. The sky is snowing. The sky is snowing, Rory, and overnight the earth's been eider downed to feather white. Today is World Book Day, but the schools are shut, and the playground for the rails is a bassinet of silent snow. No bird or bill will go to school today, no Alice or Garofalo. On the news, a garter snake of cars has slept the night below the frozen stars. The sky is snowing, love in pale marshmallows and flecks of mint. You're at the kitchen window in your burger stripes and mask and bag of swag, my little crooked scallywag. Let's lift the window open just to slip and catch this snowstorm on your fingertip. And I'll finish by reading a poem. This is the only, like, uh, you know, apart from um, of the students that I taught, the only real name is uh, in the title of this poem, um, someone who I, who I still see around Wood Green in London. Some, we go to the same gym. You're the heel, that's awful for me, not for him. Sonnet for Darren. Men don't look at me like this anymore, the way this tall young man is looking at me. I feel my heart swing open like a door. The traffic lights flash red. Rory, just three, rolls backwards and forwards on his tricycle. The man's still looking, yes, at me, his smile like heaven. I remember this, trouble, desire, bliss, but God, it's been a while. And here he is, so close I can smell his skin. White t-shirt gleaming, his afro flamed like sunbeams around his face which is lovely, like a dream I used to have. And now his mouth is moving, saying, Miss, it's me, Darren, remember? 
We chat, lights change, Rory and I cross over. Thank you all for listening.